Everett Heeman. I'm the pastor across the street at St. Thomas Aquinas Church and Catholic Student Center. I also uh, serve in a volunteer capacity here at the university on the Institutional Review Board for Human Subjects. So I find myself uh, working with uh, some of you who are on the faculty and doing research in that area. Although you probably don't know that I do that because my name doesn't appear on the forms that get signed. Um, Tonight we're very honored to be able to hear from Dr. Hunter. Um, Dr. Hunter has occupied the um, Monsignor James Supple Chair of Catholic Studies at Iowa State University for the past five years. St. Thomas Aquinas um, established that chair about uh, eight, seven years ago, I think it was, uh, with the intent of being a contributor to the mission of this university that is to enter into dialogue and to in the search of truth. And uh, we hope that um, something of our tradition is a valuable piece uh, at this university. And it seems to be turning out that way. Prior to coming to Iowa State, uh, Dr. Hunter taught for 15 years uh, at, uh, in the Department of Theology at the University of St. Thomas in St. Paul, Minnesota. He received an undergraduate and a master's degree in Latin from the Catholic University of America in Washington, DC. He did his MA in theology at the University of St. Michael's College in Toronto, and his PhD is from uh, the University of Notre Dame. Dr. Hunter has published rather extensively in the area of early Christianity and his special interest and his special focus in his research and writing has been in the traditions of marriage and celibacy. So this evening we welcome him to speak on the topic of priestly celibacy in the Catholic Church, its origins, its history, and its future. Dr. Hunter. Thank you. Thank you, Father Ev. And uh, thank you all for coming uh, tonight. I know it's uh, getting towards the end of the semester, and it's a uh, very kind of tiring time, especially for students. So it's good to see so many of you here. Before, before I get started, too, I want to uh, just mention, I think this is the first time that a uh, supple lecture has been given uh, uh, without the presence of, uh, without the physical presence of Monsignor Supple himself. Um, as I think many of you know, um, Monsignor St. James Supple died last uh, August. And so I just wanted to recall him and uh, uh, you know, remind uh, everyone of his presence, because I certainly know it's the case that uh, I wouldn't be here if it were not for him. And I think it's the case that um, many of you would not be here if it were not for, for Father Supple. Um, so uh, I have to mention that. Well, it's a, it's a big topic, uh, priestly celibacy uh, in the Catholic Church, especially origins, history, and future, uh, just to cover everything. Well, if I were to actually to speak in detail about all of these things, uh, we would be here a very, very long time. Uh, I might even lose some friends, uh, and I'm sure I would lose some students. Um, but uh, my choice of this topic, uh, and even the phrasing, origins, history, and future, was uh, deliberate. Uh, because I think Catholicism, uh, more than most forms of Christianity, has a very special connection with its uh, history. And I think any intelligent discussion of Catholic thought or practice, or whether there are to be changes in, um, in the church, must be informed uh, by uh, an understanding of why these practices or why uh, these beliefs started in the first place. For much of its history, and I've actually I've been surprised by this the more that I've looked into the, the whole history of celibacy, priestly celibacy, especially in the, in the church, uh, it's been controversial all the way along. Uh, and I think recent events in the American Catholic Church have simply caused the requirement to fall under even greater scrutiny. Now, by recent events, I mean, of course, the explosion of accusations of clerical uh, 
sexual abuse within the past two years, especially. And these have once again raised this issue. Many Catholics have begun to wonder whether the problem might not lie with the celibacy requirement itself, or at least with a kind of culture that many believe is fostered by the practice of celibacy. Jay Dolan, the distinguished American Catholic historian at Notre Dame, has expressed this view in a postscript to his recent book, In Search of an American Catholicism. And I quote, by fostering a clerical culture of arrogance and secrecy, the church has failed to respond to the needs, spiritual and social, of the people in the pew. This crisis in the church has necessitated a painful and difficult examination of deeper issues affecting the Catholic community and revealed the need for far-reaching change. Most crucially, the American Catholic Church is running out of priests, and the shortage is wearing out the many excellent priests who are not only overworked, but also deeply troubled by the sexual abuse scandal. The church has tried to fill the gap by importing clergy from other countries, but this is a shameful admission that after 300 years on American soil, the church cannot recruit an American-born clergy. Professor Dolan then proceeds to the following recommendation. Again, I quote, I believe the answer to this dilemma is to open the priesthood to men who wish to be married as well as to women who want to be ordained. A celibate male clerical <coughs> culture, impervious to outside scrutiny, has created the worst scandal in the history of American Catholicism. It is time for change. My hope is that change will occur." End quote. Professor Dolan's words reflect the views of many Catholics who believe that a change in the church's practice of priestly celibacy is warranted, both because of changes in the wider society and because of developments within the church's own understanding of priestly ministry. It is not my purpose tonight to argue for a change in the celibacy requirement, although I will address the question briefly at the end of my talk. For the most part, I want to take a step back from the current issue and examine the historical origins of the requirement of priestly celibacy. Unfortunately, this is an area where there is widespread misinformation, both on the question of the origins of the requirement and on its history. Perhaps the most prevalent misconception is the view, which I've often read in the, in the papers, even in our own uh, Ames Tribune, uh, the view that celibacy as a requirement for priests only emerged in the 12th century. There is an element of truth in this view, but only in a narrow and very technical sense. It was only in the 12th century, at the First Lateran Council of 1123, that leaders of the Western Church declared the marriage of any person in higher orders to be invalid. Previously, such marriages were forbidden, but when they took place, as they often did, they were considered true marriages. The change was the declaration of the invalidity of clerical marriage. Shortly afterwards, at the Second Lateran Council in 1139, the ordination of married men was forbidden. So it is true that the 12th century was a genuine turning point in the sense that marriage and holy orders or priesthood were officially declared to be incompatible, and this had not been the case previously. <coughs> However, there is another sense in which the word celibacy is used, one that is immediately relevant to our topic. If by celibacy we mean not the prohibition of marriage, but rather a requirement of sexual abstinence or continence that is imposed even on married priests, then the origins of priestly celibacy go back much earlier, nearly 800 years before the 12th century Lateran councils. This is one point on which all historians agree. That is, the earliest evidence of an attempt to require celibacy, that is, celibacy in the sense of sexual abstinence from the clergy, is to be found in the fourth century. First, there was a local council of Spanish bishops, which met at Ovira sometime around the year uh, 309, which forbade married bishops, presbyters, and deacons to have sex with their wives and produce children. 
Later, at the end of the fourth century, Bishop Sericius of Rome addressed a series of letters to bishops in Gaul, Spain, and North Africa in which he asserted that married clergy in higher orders must abstain from sex permanently. Around the same time as Pope Sergius' decrees, we also have a number of other um, uh, writers in Italy and Rome uh, who attest to the same thing. Therefore, the firm evidentiary starting point of any account of the history of priestly celibacy are these fourth century texts. Before examining these documents in detail, which uh, I intend to do, there is another misconception, and it's one almost on the exact opposite side, that I must address. 20 years ago, virtually every informed Catholic scholar would have placed the origins of the requirement of celibacy for priests in the fourth century, as I have done. Uh, this is still the majority view, uh, and I think it's the correct view. Recently, however, that it is within the last 20 years, some Catholic scholars have argued that the requirement of priestly celibacy goes back much earlier than the fourth century, back to apostolic times, even back to Jesus himself. The proponents of this theory include a Jesuit historian, Christian Cochini, a German cardinal and uh, prefect of the Vatican Library, Alphonse Maria Stickler, and most recently, a German theologian, Stefan Hyde. All three have argued that celibacy, in the sense of permanent sexual continence, was required of bishops, presbyters, and deacons from the earliest days of the church, even though most of them were married. Now, each of these writers is aware that this view goes well beyond the explicit evidence, which dates only from the fourth century. So they try in various ways to move behind the earliest evidence of legislation, and they hypothesize that a requirement existed apart from any explicit legislation. All of these attempts are, in my opinion, historically dubious. They seem to be motivated by a desire to defend the church's present discipline by grounding it in something other than church tradition, namely the direct command of Jesus himself or of the apostles. In my view, this approach sacrifices responsible history to theological bias. And I'm going to offer you a couple of examples. In his book, The Case for Clerical Celibacy, Its Historical Development and Theological Foundations, Cardinal Alphonse Stickler attempts to trace priestly celibacy back to the original teaching of Jesus. He appeals to some of the radical sayings of Jesus about the kingdom of God. For example, Luke 18, verse 28 to 30, where Jesus tells Peter, who is evidently married, quote, I tell you solemnly, there is no one who has left house, wife, brothers, parents, or children for the sake of the kingdom of God who will not be given repayment many times over in the present time and in the world to come, eternal life. Now, although the text does not refer to priests or to any other church officials, which of course would have been a, a, an anachronism in the days of Jesus, the cardinal comments, and I quote, here we clearly already have the first obligation of clerical celibacy, namely the commitment to continence in the use of marriage after ordination, end quote. There are several problems with this type of argument. Cardinal Stickler is certainly right in stressing that Jesus placed radical demands on his disciples, at least on some of them. He discreetly ignores Jesus' equally well-attested affirmation of the permanence of marriage. Now, there is no doubt that sexual renunciation emerged as a Christian ideal very, very early in the tradition, based on sayings of Paul himself in 1 Corinthians 7. But there is no good historical reason to identify or equate this form of radical discipleship with what later became the Catholic priesthood. What lies behind this view, I think, is an oversimplification of the history of early Christianity and the development of early Christian ministry in particular. Cardinal Stickler assumes that the core of Jesus' disciples, some of whom became apostles or Christian missionaries after the resurrection, are identical in terms of their ministerial functions with the later offices of bishop, priest, and deacon. 
Now, it is true that according to Catholic theology, ecclesiastical authority passed from the apostles to the bishops by means of a process that is called apostolic succession. And I think in very, very general terms, this is not just a theological theory, but it's, it's also true historically, in the sense that eventually bishops did come to occupy the main teaching uh, role that was originally uh, held by the apostles. But the complete historical reality of early Christianity is much more complex. From the earliest times, of course, there were apostles who were generally itinerant missionaries. In their absence, the churches were administered by local officials who were sometimes called elders or presbyters, presbyteroi, and sometimes they were called overseers, uh, what we call bishops, episcopoi. These leaders exercised oversight in the communities, and that's why they were called overseers. None of the New Testament documents or early Christian, earliest Christian sources speaks of priesthood being transmitted from the apostles to bishops or elders. Nor can we assume that what later were seen as priestly or sacramental functions were reserved to the apostles or to the overseer bishops. In addition to apostles, for example, Paul lists many uh, other ministerial uh, uh, functions or gifts of service. For example, he lists, uh, in addition to apostles, he lists uh, prophets, teachers, miracle workers, healers, uh, and other administrators. Um, and in fact, one of the earliest Christian texts that we have outside of the New Testament, a document called the Teaching of the Twelve Apostles, or uh, also known as the, the Didache, indicates that prophets uh, were allowed in, uh, in some early Christian communities to recite prayers. Actually, it, the, the word that's used, the Greek word is, is Eucharistize, that is, do the Eucharist or do the Eucharistic prayers, uh, as well as uh, other leaders. Uh, so, in other words, my point is that we cannot assume a strict equivalence between the ministry of the original disciples or apostles and that of later bishops, elders, or deacons. Still less can we assume a continuous requirement of celibacy. In other words, even if it were proven um, that Jesus' closest disciples or the apostles were required to be celibate, and I don't think Stickler has, has proven this, this still wouldn't, it still wouldn't follow uh, that the first bishops, elders, and deacons also had to be celibate. A closer look at an important New Testament text helps to illustrate the contrast between the early apostolic ministry. Then and the ministry of the apostles, you have to be clear, is, a, is one of uh, itinerant preaching, um, spreading the gospel. Uh, which is distinct from the ministry of oversight or service that the bishops, elders, and uh, deacons do. Well, in the first letter to Timothy, uh, or I'm sorry, the first letter to Timothy, along with the second letter to Timothy and the letter to Titus, um, is among the latest writings of the New Testament. Scholars are nearly unanimous uh, in attributing them not to Paul, but to a later disciple of Paul at the end of the first century. These three letters are often referred to as the pastoral epistles uh, because they reflect a stage in the development of the church in which overseers, that is bishops, elders, and deacons, have become the primary pastors rather than the apostles. Uh, moreover, in contrast to the radical discipleship demanded by Jesus, that is the leaving home, family, wife, etc., the pastoral epistles portray the loving husband and father as the ideal steward of the church. For example, in 1 Timothy 3, verses 2 to 5, we find the following description of the suitable overseer or bishop. And I quote, Now a bishop must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, temperate, sensible, respectable, hospitable, an apt teacher, not a drunkard, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, and not a lover of money. He must manage his own household well, keeping his children submissive and respectful in every way. For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how can he take care of God's church? By all appearances, the pastoral epistles 
present marriage, procreation, and a sound family life as prerequisites for pastoral ministry as a bishop, presbyter, or deacon. Now, I do not think that this passage from 1 Timothy should be interpreted as presenting a requirement that clergy should be married, as some commentators have suggested. I would be very, very surprised if the pastoral epistles intended to exclude unmarried or celibate people from ministry. But I do think it shows that by the end of the first century, Jesus' radical demands had been tempered to the needs of the church at that time. The imminent kingdom of God announced by Jesus had already started to become a well-organized church. Its leaders were now sought from among those who had demonstrated their pastoral suitability by their stable commitment to the central institution of Greco-Roman society, that is, the household. Nothing is said in these texts about celibacy as a requirement for these married officials. Now, when confronted with texts such as 1 Timothy, the proponents of the apostolic origins of priestly celibacy are forced into the most convoluted uh, arguments. Stefan Hyde, for example, and here he's following a suggestion by uh, Cardinal Stickler, he focuses on the words, a husband of one wife. Hyde argues that this means a candidate for the clergy must not have been married more than once. And that's, that's a reasonable interpretation, although it's not the only one. The reason for this prohibition of a second marriage, then, Hyde suggests, is that a second marriage, according to Paul, shows a lack of self-control. And Paul did say something like this in 1 Corinthians 7. Why is this lack of self-control an impediment to orders, holy orders, Hyde asks? Well, his answer is that because complete sexual abstinence was required of the clergy right from the very beginning. Well, with this sort of reasoning, what Hyde and Stickler have managed to do is to insert a requirement of clerical celibacy into a passage that strongly suggests the very opposite. And I think this is a good example of what is called eisegesis, that is, the reading of one's own um, position or bias into the text of Scripture. Well, this takes me to a, a critical question. If, as I've argued, the, the requirement of priestly celibacy is not found in the age of the apostles, then where is it to be found? As I've already noted, the, the first explicit evidence comes from the fourth century. But I think it's worth asking, is it possible to find some evidence, not evidence, but since the evidence is only fourth century, but is it possible that the requirement actually predates the evidence? And at this point, I think uh, an insight from Cardinal Stickler is useful. He is, or was, I'm not sure if he's still alive, uh, was an expert on canon law. And uh, he observes that normally in law, whether it's uh, secular law or church law, um, a, an obligation, what he calls uh, in Latin, uh, jus, from which we get our word justitia, or justice, that an obligation um, can exist and be an obligatory legal norm before it's actually expressed or uh, written down in legislation. Okay? In other words, a law, he says, can be handed down, usually is handed down orally or by custom before it's actually promulgated in written form. Now, I think Stickler's wrong to use this as a way to uh, argue that celibacy goes back to the time of the apostles. But on the other hand, it does seem to be a reasonable argument for uh, seeing some kind of uh, informal practice, if not a requirement, but at least an informal practice of priestly celibacy uh, prior to the fourth century, that is prior to the explicit legislation. Well, how far back can you make this sort of hypothesis? Well, uh, it's difficult to say. Uh, I think because by definition, if it's an oral tradition, it has not left many um, traces in the written evidence. Personally, uh, my view is that probably a custom, not a requirement, but a custom of celibacy for priests gradually developed um, maybe starting 100 years earlier, maybe in the, in the third century. And we do have, I think, some pieces of evidence that suggest this is, uh, this is correct. For example, there's not one text in the whole second century 
that mentions priestly celibacy at all. And this, I think, is yet another reason uh, or fact that strongly supports the view that such a requirement did not exist. And then right at the end of the second century, early years of the third century, we have a Christian writer in Alexandria named Clement who refers uh, to married priests and deacons uh, as if they're simply a well-established and well-accepted phenomenon. Uh, for example, Clement uh, alludes to the pastoral epistles, the same passage that I read a minute ago from 1 Timothy, and he says, here the Apostle Paul, I quote, expresses approval of the man who is husband of a single wife, whether elder, deacon, or layman, if he gives no ground for criticism in his practice of marriage or use of marriage. He will find salvation through bringing children into the world. And that's a quotation from 1 Timothy. So Clement appears to assume, this is the end of the second century, early third century, Clement appears to assume that marriage and procreation were appropriate for clergy and laity alike. However, it's in the third century then that we do start to find a couple of Christian writers who mention, uh, usually in passing, uh, that some priests, some members of the clergy, do live in celibacy. For example, Tertullian, of Carthage in North Africa, and Origen uh, of Alexandria in Egypt. Both refer to the fact that some priests do live in perpetual sexual continence. Now, we have to be a little bit careful uh, here, because both Tertullian and Origen were somewhat extremists on the case of uh, celibacy. For example, Tertullian left the mainstream, what was already called the Catholic Church at that point, uh, and joined a prophetic sect called the Montanists, uh, at least partly because Montanists forbade or prohibited Christians to marry more than once, whereas the mainstream church allowed people to remarry and Tertullian um, approved the stricter sexual ethics of the Montanists. Uh, and in fact, Tertullian didn't think very much of first single marriages uh, either. Uh, he takes a radical interpretation of Paul and says that you know, the only reason to marry is if you are too weak to, to uh, be celibate, and therefore it is a kind of sin, even though it's permissible. That's Tertullian. The other, um, the, the other man, Origen, uh, similarly wasn't a very uh, big fan of sex or marriage. Uh, Origen was thoroughly influenced by uh, Platonic philosophy, uh, he considered all physical, sensual activity as a, as a, a kind of dangerous distraction from the spiritual life. Uh, it was also widely believed in the ancient world that Origen had castrated himself uh, in an attempt to become a eunuch for the kingdom of God. Um, modern scholars dispute whether this is true or not, but it shows you that Origen uh, certainly had a reputation for extremism. Nonetheless, despite these, the, the kind of marginal, perhaps, status of, of these two writers, um, what they said about the existence of celibate priests is probably true, historically. Um, moreover, their views represented the future of Christian thought. As the third century proceeds, we find an increasing uh, enthusiasm for celibacy, uh, we now find treatises in the third century, uh, documents written um, especially for young women uh, in praise of the, the life, the permanent life of virginity. It's also in the third century that we see a great proliferation of apocryphal acts and uh, gospels that also tend to exalt the, the life of celibacy. So in this context where celibacy, celibacy itself, uh, across the whole spectrum of of, of Christian, not just in the clergy, in this context where celibacy itself is being presented as the ideal way to be a Christian, the ideal way to be an apostle, it's, it's natural that gradually um, clergy would have started to adopt the, the custom, even if they were married. And I think this is uh, the context then out of which the fourth century requirement later emerged. Well, this brings me to the second aspect of uh, my topic, and I'll, the next two aspects are going to be, I'm going to address a much briefer um, form. But one reason I've dwelt so much on this question of the origins, that is where it came from, 
um, is that how one looks at the origins directly affects how you tell the story of the history. Okay? In other words, um, if, if a person holds that the origins of the celibacy requirement is an apostolic tradition, then the later expressions in laws, for example, the letters of Pope Sirikius, they become just a further explicitation of an already existing, though unwritten, uh, law or tradition. In other words, there's a fundamental continuity between the later um, law and the earlier tradition. But on the other hand, if in the beginning the clergy were free to marry or not, then the emergence of the requirement in the fourth century will appear to be something of an innovation, even if it did evolve out of this earlier custom. Now the difference between these two ways of looking at the history becomes especially <coughs> acute when we take into account that the Eastern Christian churches, all the evidence that I refer to, or most of the evidence I refer to is from the Western half of the, the church. Well, in the Eastern churches, celibacy was never adopted as a requirement for elders uh, or deacons. The legislation of the Eastern Church, which reached final form in 691 at the Second Council of Trollo, specified that bishops were required to be celibate, and they were usually chosen from among the monks, but priests and deacons who were married before ordination could continue to live a normal married life and have children. If their wives died, however, these priests and deacons were required to remain unmarried. And that's the, the custom in most of the Eastern churches today. Well, if one assumes, like uh, Stefan Hyde and Cardinal Stickler do, that sexual continence from the beginning was required of all the clergy, then the Eastern Christian practice appears as an innovation, a legitimate concession, sometimes they say, to human weakness, but fundamentally a departure from apostolic tradition. But if one holds, as I think one should, and as most, let's say, most Catholic historians do, that originally there was greater latitude, then the Eastern Church's practice appears to be no less genuine a development than the Roman Catholic one. And in fact, it appears to conform even more closely to the original tradition insofar as it allows for both a married and a, and a celibate clergy. Now, I, I mention these ecumenical implications, not to prejudice the historical question, but simply to point out that these historical issues have direct implications for relations between the churches, especially between the Eastern Orthodox and the Roman Catholic. The debate over priestly celibacy was one of the factors that led to the separation between the East and the West uh, in the Great Schism of 1054. And the future of Catholic Orthodox relations will no doubt hinge, at least partly, on the resolution of the question of priestly celibacy. But I want to return to the, the question of the history of the celibacy requirement. If we assume for a moment that my argument so far has been correct, um, then we can proceed to ask another question. What led to the formation of the requirement, of the explicit prohibition of sexual relations for clergy in the fourth century church. Why did the Western church move from an original option for clergy to be either married or unmarried to an informal custom of priestly celibacy in the third century to the formal prohibition of sexual activity in the fourth century? The answer, I think, is very complex. And it involves a, a confluence of different factors, some of them theological, some of them ritual or uh, liturgical, and to a certain extent, political. And in order to approach this question, I want to examine a little more closely the most extensive body of evidence that we have, which um, are these three letters of uh, Pope Sergius from the late fourth century. Now, each of these letters was written by Pope Sergius who served as Bishop of Rome from 385 to 399. Uh, the first document is a letter addressed to a Spanish bishop, uh, Himerius, who had written to, da uh, to Sirichius' predecessor, Damasus, but Damasus had died before he answered the letter, and so Sirichius answered it when he became <coughs> Pope. Uh, the second is a letter to, it's sort of a circular letter to a number of Western bishops um, 
that reports the decision of a council that took place at Rome in 386. And the third is a letter uh, written to bishops in Gaul, uh, that's modern day France and Germany, um, in response to some questions and concerns that some of the bishops had raised in correspondence to Pope Sirikius. All three of these letters presuppose that the imposition of celibacy on the clergy is creating widespread opposition. And this is another indication, I think, that it's, it was not a very long-standing tradition. Uh, some of the bishops support the requirement, clearly. Others do not. Those who oppose compulsory celibacy, and we, we can kind of reconstruct this from the way Pope Sirikius answers, he says they appeal to the pastoral epistles and the fact that, that Paul, the author of 1 Timothy, allows marriage. They also cite the precedent of Old Testament priests who were married. On the other hand, those who uh, support the celibacy requirement, they have written to Pope Sirikius, especially in the third letter, and asked him to clarify the purpose of the, of the requirement. Well, in the course of his response, Pope Sirikius offers several different reasons for the imposition of celibacy on the higher clergy. First, he appeals to what might be called the ascetic value of celibacy. That is, Sirikius points out that one function of the priest is to urge consecrated virgins, widows, and uh, even married Christians to adopt celibacy or persevere in celibacy. And so Sirikius asks, how can a priest credibly preach celibacy to others if he himself is not observing celibacy and is, is producing children? Well, Sirikius' argument here clearly reflects the situation of the church in the later fourth century. The monastic movement had begun about 100 years uh, earlier. It had spread very widely through the, the Roman Empire. The idea that uh, celibacy was a, a higher and superior way of life uh, had become well accepted, uh, although there were certain Christians like Jovinian, who I spoke about, I think, uh, two or three years ago, uh, who had challenged this consensus. Uh, also, a significant fact is that most of these new ascetics were lay people, and many, maybe the majority, were women. In this context, it was becoming obvious that clerical authority could not stand or be credible unless the clergy could adopt the same ascetic ideals that were being adopted by the Christian laity. And so the imposition of sexual continence as a requirement on the higher clergy was one way in which the status of the clergy could be maintained in this changed environment of the late fourth century. But asceticism was not the only or even the primary reason that Sirikius gave for insisting on sexual continence for the clergy. In all three letters, the most prominent argument is based on the sacred character of the priest's function and on the need to reject sex in order to avoid ritual impurity. Drawing on, an old, on old Testament traditions that required priests to undergo ritual purification prior to performing their service in the temple, Pope Sirikius observes that the Christian priest has to be ready every day or at any time to perform the sacred functions of baptism and Eucharist. As a result, he says, unlike the priests of the Old Testament, who only had to abstain from sex during the time when they, they were in the temple, in fact, Pope Sirikia says they spent the whole year in the temple, they didn't go home, so they didn't have to worry about having sex with their, uh, with their wives. He says, well, in the case of Christian priests, he says, they have to be sexually content or ritually pure all the time. And this is a quotation from uh, one of the letters of Sirichius. The ministers of God are under the obligation to observe purity. It is obvious that this is always a necessity for them. They must either give baptism or offer sacrifice. Would an impure man dare to soil what is holy when holy things are for holy people? End quote. Later in the same letter, Sirikius notes that since, I quote, Intercourse is defiling. Comixtio pollutio est. 
The priest must avoid sex in order to be continually ready to offer supplication and prayers on behalf of the sins of the community. Now, at first glance, it might sound like Sirichius is appealing strictly to Old Testament notions of ritual purity. And he certainly does mention these explicitly at several points. But even more central to his argument is the New Testament texts, text of 1 Corinthians 7, 5, where Paul states that even married Christians should abstain from sex for a time in order to devote themselves to prayer but should return to intercourse so that they do not fall victim to Satan's temptation. So Syracuse's argument is that since the ministers of the church must be ready at all times to baptize, offer Eucharist, and intercede on behalf of the community, they must be perpetually free of the defilement that comes from sexual intercourse. Now modern Christians are understandably shocked when they encounter such ideas in the ancient literature. However, the notion of a ritual defilement that accompany childbirth, menstruation, sexual intercourse, and dead bodies was deeply rooted in ancient cultures, in Jewish as well as pagan cultures. Now, Christianity had distanced itself from some of these ritual taboos, but obviously not from all of them. Indeed, as the church moved into the Middle Ages, the ritual prohibitions surrounding sex, even within marriage, appear to have increased rather than decreased. For example, a collection of legal texts from 5th century Gaul ruled that a, a couple should remain celibate on their wedding night out of respect for the nuptial blessing that they had received from the priest. In the early 6th century, Bishop Caesarius of Arles proposed that a married couple should not enter church for 30 days after being married. And, I guess they figured after 30 days they, they, were, they were slowing down or something. <laughs> um, he also says that they should abstain from sex for several days prior to receiving communion. Right about the same time, uh, that is early in the 6th century, one of the earliest Irish penitential books, the Penitential Athenian, prescribed that married persons were to practice sexual continence during all of Advent, Lent, and the 40 days after Pentecost. It is no wonder, given these deep reservations about sexuality, that ecclesiastical officials would have attempted gradually to separate the clergy from all sexual activity. The fourth century was a time when the Roman Empire and the Christian Church were becoming ever more closely fused Christians desperately needed to have models of sanctity and purity, and celibacy more than any other virtue served this positive function. Moreover, the increasing elaboration of Christian rituals, and again, the fourth century is a time when we start to have lots of rituals that weren't there earlier, consecration of virgins, even the marriage rituals. We, we don't have any evidence of them until the, the fourth century. Well, the more that rituals become elaborate, the more that the clergy are seen as people who stand between heaven and earth in a way and mediate the prayers of God uh, or the, the prayers of the community to God. And given that sex is seen uh, as an obstacle to prayer, again, according to 1 Corinthians 7, 5, um, it had become well accepted by the late 4th century that ministers of the sacraments had to embrace sexual continence in order for their prayers and intercessions to be effective. Well, so far, and I'm getting near the end of my talk, so far I've only touched on the first, uh, though probably uh, the most important stage in the history of priestly celibacy in the Catholic Church. If there were time, which there isn't, but if there were time to look at other periods of history, we would see that at different points in the history of, of the Church, different issues uh, become central. For example, in the 11th and 12th centuries, the enforcement of priestly celibacy, which had been widely neglected for, for centuries prior to this, it became central to the way in which the church tried to establish its freedom over against the intrusion of uh, lay uh, control. Marriages of the clergy had to be declared invalid and their children declared illegitimate in order to prevent church property from being legally inherited by a priest's children. 
And that's why those two Lateran councils that I mentioned at the beginning of my talk, that's why the, the critical development there was that the marriage of these priests was declared to be invalid, which meant their children were illegitimate, which meant they could not inherit. And so that seems to be the central issue there in the 11th and, and 12th centuries. Although it's also the case that it's, it's in the, the, the 12th century that the theology of the Eucharist in particular uh, is becoming particularly the focus of concern. Uh, the, the notion of transubstantiation starts to circulate in the 12th century, becomes widely circulated in the 12th century, developed a little earlier. And so again, the, the, the higher a concept of the Eucharistic sacrifice people had, the more the notion of the priest as a, a, a kind of um, an individual set apart from, from profane concerns becomes, becomes central to, to Catholic teaching. Well, so much for the history. Um, I also promised to say something about the future of priestly celibacy. And so before I close, I'd like to address this topic, uh, specifically the question